So it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you, Nick, to speak to us on tomorrow's battlefield, U.S. proxy wars, and secret ops in Africa. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for joining me today. You know, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, and, and to finally have a chance to uh, discuss my work on the continent where it really matters most. And I especially want to thank uh, the Afro Middle East Center uh, for making my book available here, for bringing me uh, for the first time to South Africa, and uh, for providing me the opportunity to speak with all of you tonight. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, Concerned Africans Forum and uh, the University of Johannesburg for hosting me tonight. So, I thought that I'd uh, begin my talk, where I begin my book, with a military ceremony that took place behind closed doors. A ceremony that neither you nor I was ever meant to see. And this ceremony, which uh, you can see a, a screen grab of it here, uh, it didn't take place on my home continent, uh, nor yours, but it's, it had and it, it still has uh, grave implications for all of us. Uh, this ceremony took place on July 12, 2013, when a group of uh, elite U.S. military uh, officers assembled on a stage in Stuttgart, Germany, uh, in front of a humongous uh, American flag, as you can see. Uh, among them, Captain J. Dane Thorlipson, who is uh, seated on the stage there. Uh, he was the outgoing commander at the time of a highly specialized and elite unit known as Naval Special Warfare uh, Unit 10. And uh, Captain Robert Smith, the man at the lectern there, uh, who was the commanding officer of its parent unit, Naval Special Warfare Group 2. And before this, uh, the small crowd of military personnel these men spoke about something that's, uh, that's rarely mentioned in public, secret U.S. military missions in Africa. Uh, by that summer, uh, representatives of U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM, uh, the umbrella organization for all U.S. operations on the continent, uh, had told me again and again that the U.S. military presence in Africa was small, uh, episodic, and above all, that it was benign. Uh, and this has been uh, the line from AFRICOM since it was founded in, uh, in 2008. You know, nothing much of note, they insisted, was uh, going on in Africa. But at this closed door ceremony, before this uh, select crowd of insiders, the officers on stage offered a, a starkly different uh, picture of military operations. This is a quote. The mission of Naval Special Warfare Unit 10 does not pause, uh, Smith told the audience. Forces are deploying as we speak down on the African continent. That mission does not stop. He added, some people like to think that Africa is our next ridge line. And then he set his audience straight. Africa, he said, is our current ridge line. Smith also described partnerships with uh, African militaries across the continent from Nigeria to Uganda to Somalia uh, while lauding uh, the departing commander Thorlifson's efforts. Quote, he has led this fight with his own boots on the ground in Africa. And that's what Smith said. Uh, and that caught my attention because it didn't sound like the standard AFRICOM line uh, about a few troops uh, conducting a handful of humanitarian operations. Uh, it sounded as if he was saying that America's most elite forces were at war in Africa. Then Thorlifson uh, took to the lectern himself, and he offered an even more striking vision of operations. Reflecting on uh, two years in command in Africa, Thorlifson discussed what he called the high tempo of operations, with personnel, quote, deployed 365 days a year, and he lauded his troops for successfully operating in what he called a complex battle space. Then he quoted his boss, uh, Major General James Linder, who was then the commander of uh, all special operations forces in Africa. 
He told the crowd, quote, General Linder has been saying that Africa is the battlefield of tomorrow today. And he followed, I couldn't agree more. This new battlefield is exactly where we need to be today, and I expect will be for some time in the future. On hearing this, my ears perked up, because this closed-door ceremony corroborated exactly what my reporting had uncovered over the previous year. And it convinced me that I needed to keep digging into just what uh, the U.S. military was doing, far from prying eyes, all across Africa. And Commander Thorlifson wasn't joking when he talked about the, uh, the high tempo of operations. That tempo has, uh, has also continued to grow since 2013. Uh, back in 2008, when AFRICOM began operations, it inherited 172 missions, activities, and programs on the continent. This just offers you a look at the, the type of uh, activities that often go on, go on. Uh, this being U.S. Special Operations Forces training in Cameroon. <laughs> By 2013, the combined total of all U.S. activities uh, like this one reached 546, an average of more than one mission per day. In 2014, this number leapt to 674. In other words, U.S. troops were carrying out uh, two operations, exercises, or activities from drone strikes to counterinsurgency instruction, uh, intelligence gathering to marksmanship training, somewhere on the continent every single day. And this represents uh, an almost 300% jump in these types of uh, operations and exercises. Uh, and most of all, military to military training activities like this one. Uh, so this has meant uh, more troops, on the ground and as a result more bases all over the continent. And with all these missions, bases, and troops has come a desire for more surveillance carried out by drone aircraft and, uh, and also the manned variety. The idea is to have an eye in the sky in as many places as possible with the eventual goal of complete coverage over almost every corner of the continent. And uh, you can see uh, from this map, uh, right at the top, uh, th there's a map on this uh, secret document that I was able to obtain. And it shows some of the places where uh, the U.S. military could cover uh, in 2013 and where they want to cover in the future. This is just a, uh, a closer look. Now, the current inability to fully cover the continent is uh, encapsulated in a, in a favorite term that the military uses right now. They call it the tyranny of distance. And this is a reference to the great <coughs> lengths that aircraft must fly from their base to their target area. Uh, surveillance flights are, of course, uh, limited by fuel and, in the case of manned aircraft, the endurance of pilots. So one way that you can uh, overcome this, of course, is by putting more bases in more places. And that's just what the U.S. military has done. It's constructed a, uh, a network of at least 14 key airfields integral to surveillance uh, all across the continent. And from this slide, uh, you, know, you can see them uh, dotting the map. Uh, in case you can't see the slide, uh, these are or have been located in uh, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Niger, the Seychelles, Uganda, as well as in thank you, Djibouti, uh, where the crown jewel of U.S. bases can be found. And that facility, uh, Camp Lemonnye, was once a French Foreign Legion outpost. Today, you can still find French troops there, uh, but the base is now overwhelmingly American. Uh, the camp has seen the number of U.S. personnel stationed there uh, jump by about 450 percent since 2002. And over that same uh, time span, uh, it's also expanded from about 88 acres to uh, nearly 600 acres. And it's seen more than $600 million uh, U.S. dollars already uh, allocated or awarded for projects such as aircraft parking aprons, uh, taxiways, 
and a major special operations compound that's uh, just becoming active uh, right about now. And in addition to this uh, $600 million, uh, an additional $1.2 billion uh, in construction and improvements has also been planned for the future. For a variety of reasons, uh, U.S. drones don't even fly out of Camp Lemigny anymore. And that's something I could, I could talk a little bit about more later. Uh, all the drones have been moved uh, to this site here, about 10 kilometers away. It's a less visible locale uh, known as Chibeli Airfield, uh, where the U.S. has flown missions against targets in uh, both Africa and the Middle East. And this base has, uh, has also grown at an astounding rate over a very short period of time. The buildup you see depicted here, uh, beginning in the upper left-hand corner, that was in uh, early 2013. You can see it's, uh, or maybe you can't from this, but it's, it's basically uh, a tarmac and some shipping containers there. They really uh, have, have increased uh, their footprint at this base. And the, uh, the Djiboutian facilities uh, and the 12 other surveillance outposts are themselves uh, just a fraction of the bases, uh, camps, compounds, port facilities, uh, fuel bunkers, and other sites that have popped up in at least 34 countries, uh, pictured here, more than 60% of the nations on this continent. Uh, these include uh, small outposts in Central African Republic, Chad, Kenya, Mali, Niger, the Seychelles, Somalia, South Sudan, Uganda. There are uh, also 15 so-called uh, cooperative security locations, or CSLs, in places like uh, Senegal, Ghana, and Gabon. The U.S. military also has access to locations in Algeria, Botswana, Namibia, Sao Tome and Principe, Sierra Leone, Tunisia, and Zambia and fuel bunkers and port facilities in nations from Cote d'Ivoire to Mauritius. Now, the U.S. doesn't have a full-fledged base or, or even an outpost here in South Africa, but this country is uh, nonetheless a key node in the U.S. network of bases. Uh, on July 25th, 2013, the U.S. Uh, military issued what they call a pre-solicitation uh, for a contract, and you can see it here. Uh, and this contract was, uh, once awarded, would provide for nearly 65,000 uh, metric tons of marine gas oil to be, to be delivered to U.S. ships. And, uh, you know, when I, when I found this document, uh, I looked, it, uh, it runs from 2014 to 2018. It listed uh, 13 of what they call places of performance in Africa. And one of them reads, South Africa... Durban. This next document from 2014 uh, shows that a contract was indeed awarded to a group called World Fuel Services Europe Limited to provide fuel for the U.S. military in Durban. And uh, here's, a, yeah. here's a photo of a U.S. guided missile destroyer uh, docked in Durban. Um, and that's hardly the extent of uh, U.S. military contact uh, with South Africa. Uh, the U.S. military regularly conducts uh, training exercises with uh, South Africa National Defense Force. And uh, these next photos are just to give you an idea of uh, some of the types of training that go on. Uh, pistol marksmanship here, uh, a meeting of some top officers. On the far left is the, uh, the top uh, U.S. commander at AFRICOM. And, uh, and this is a, uh, uh, a military, uh, uh, military news slide showing um, some, some uh, training activities that went on during something called Shared Accord, which is a, a regular exercise uh, between the, the U.S. Uh, South African forces and other regional forces, as well as uh, usually there are some European countries that join in as well. So I'm, I'm often asked... Uh, why the U.S. has set its sights on Africa. Uh, you know, as we all know, in the uh, 19th century, the West saw Africa as a mysterious and dangerous place, a so-called dark continent. And, uh, and today, the United States uh, still sees danger in Africa. 
The U.S. military uh, views the continent as a, a hotbed of instability, Islamic extremism, and transnational terrorism. But it wasn't always this way, and it actually hasn't been this way uh, very long. In 2000, for example, a report that was prepared under the auspices of the U.S. Army War College's Strategic Studies Institute examined uh, what they call the African security environment. And while they noted the, uh, the existence of internal uh, separatist or rebel movements, as well as militias and what they called warlord armies, they made no mention of Islamic extremism or any major transnational terror threats. Even after 9-11, in, uh, in early 2002, a senior Pentagon official uh, carried out a briefing with journalists. And uh, at that time, they were trying to you know, drum up uh, this idea. Uh, you know, that, that, that Africa was uh, an unstable place and a, and a, a place of terrorist threat. And uh, this official drew attention to uh, Somali militants, uh, basically a, for, uh, a, a group that was a forerunner of al-Shabaab, several hundred members of it at the time. Uh, but when he, he was pressed by a uh, journalist, he admitted that even the most extreme members of this group, uh, quote, really have not engaged in acts of terrorism outside of Somalia. So still in 2002, according to the Pentagon, there was no true transnational threat in their estimation. So fast forward uh, 15 years after untold billions of dollars have been spent on training, arming, and supporting militaries all over Africa, after a 300% increase in U.S. missions, after the creation of a base network consisting of about 60 sites all over the continent, after fighting a coalition war in Libya, after backing proxy forces in Somalia and Mali and Central African Republic uh, and the tri-border region where uh, Nigeria, Cameroon, and, and Chad come together, uh, after launching uh, special ops raids and drone strikes in Libya and also in Somalia, the U.S. military now says the continent is rife with terror groups. Uh, late this, uh, this past summer, the current chief of U.S. Special Operations Forces in Africa, uh, Brigadier General Donald Bolduck, said that, that uh, by his estimation there were nearly 50 transnational and transregional terror groups active on the continent today. Now when I asked the Department of Defense, uh, that is the Pentagon, you know, who these groups were, they told me that they didn't know. Now, I tried to count them up myself, and if you take all the obvious ones, uh, Boko Haram, al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, al Morabitan, uh, you, know, you go through the, the entire list, uh, you know, it certainly doesn't add up to, to 47. I asked AFRICOM, they wouldn't respond to me. I asked Special Operations Command Africa, uh, they also ignored my requests. And this is typical. You know, for years, the, uh, the U.S. military has attempted to uh, deny me even uh, basic information. So while U.S. taxpayers like myself are allowed, uh, you know, or pay for it all, we're not allowed to know what our money is being used for uh, and what's being carried out in our names. And uh, even more egregiously, the U.S. military has kept this information from people all across Africa uh, whose countries are being used to further uh, supposed U.S. national security interests uh, very possibly to the detriment uh, of their own country's interests. I see that uh, I think I'm running a little short on time here. Uh, I want to leave plenty of room for discussion and Q&A, so I'll start wrapping up. And uh, since I began this talk with uh, a secret U.S. military ceremony, uh, I'll end with another one. Uh, this one carried out at a U.S. air base in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, this uh, ceremony took place on October 7th of 2015, and a group of uh, military officers gathered to commemorate a year of warfare waged in secret from Africa. Uh, they were celebrating the fact that from November of 2014 until October of 2015, a unit known as the 60th Expeditionary Reconnaissance <coughs> Squadron uh, flew MQ-1 Predator drones, uh, like the one you see right here, from Chibeli Airfield in Djibouti on secret missions 
in the Middle East. Uh, according to Major Tim Smith of the U.S. Air Force, uh, he's the gentleman on the right uh, with a big smile on his face. Uh, the unit uh, executed, uh, quote, combat flight operations in support of Operation Inherent Resolve, unquote. That is, as part of America's undeclared war on the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And here's a you know, a closer up image of uh, the one I, I showed before, a miniature. I think in this one you can see a little bit better the drones that were involved in the very operations that they were celebrating at the ceremony. There's MQ-1 Predators and there's also MQ-9 Reapers on the runway there. Uh, by the beginning of October 2015, uh, they announced at this meeting, uh, drones flown out of Djibouti had logged uh, more than 24,000 hours of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions, and we're also, quote, responsible for the neutralization, and uh, that's the U.S. military's term, uh, of 69 uh, enemy fighters, including five high-valued individuals. Now, I asked uh, for some clarification on this, uh, and they stuck to that, that there were, there were five people that they considered of high value. They would not say anything about uh, who these other 64 were, or even confirm uh, what was said at the meeting that they were enemy fighters. So the, uh, at the time the U.S. government hadn't revealed that it was flying these drone assassination missions from Africa against uh, targets in Iraq and Syria. And shortly be after I began asking questions about this ceremony, uh, the Air Force removed all public information about the unit from its website. Uh, and you know, this is something that I found again and again. Uh, the U.S. military doesn't want the public to know uh, what it says behind closed doors because what it says behind closed doors uh, vary greatly uh, from what they'll say publicly. Just last month, uh, an AFRICOM official told reporters at the Pentagon uh, that the only permanent location uh, we have in Africa is Camp Lomigny in Djibouti. They're just sticking to this. Uh, everything else he said is a light footprint. And this has been the, uh, the line of the command uh, for years, as I said. Uh, in fact, uh, at, a, at a Pentagon press conference in, uh, in April of 2014, the AFRICOM commander, uh, General David Rodriguez, swore that the United States had, uh, had little forward presence on the continent. And to hear him speak, you would think that AFRICOM was hardly engaged in Africa. But just days earlier, uh, I was the lone reporter who sat in on a, a gathering where you know, a very different story was told. Uh, it was a group of uh, military officers from AFRICOM who do the, the, the real building on the continent. It's the engineering staff. And they were speaking to representatives of some of the uh, biggest military engineering firms on the planet. Uh, and this is a quote. We have shifted our original intent of being a more congenial combatant command to an actual war fighting command. And this was uh, Captain Rick Cook, who was at the time the uh, chief of AFRICOM's engineering division, uh, speaking to the contractors. And he was unequivocal. He said that the U.S. was, quote, at war on the continent. This is what I've been uh, documenting for years. It's why I wrote uh, Tomorrow's Battlefield and why I've continued uh, and will continue uh, reporting on what Africa, uh, what AFRICOM clearly sees as a war in Africa. Uh, it remains to be seen, however, when or if AFRICOM will finally admit this to the American people and most importantly to the peoples of Africa. Uh, when that is, uh, they will tell all of us what right now they'll only say behind closed doors, that they're working to turn Africa into the battlefield of tomorrow by making it the battlefield of today. So thank you very much.